This is GoTo Inscripted. We're at GoTo Copenhagen. My name is Jeroen Engels. I am joined with Andrew Kelly. Um, so I'm a software engineer at CrowdStrike. I work uh, primarily with Elm. Uh, I like to, in my spare time, work in the uh, Elm Linter, which is called Elm Review, um, which I presented at the conference. Um, Andrew? Uh, hello. Uh, as uh, Jeroen uh, mentioned, my name is Andrew Kelly. I am the President and lead software developer of Zig Software Foundation, and uh, that sounds so much more fancy than I <laughs> what I had. <laughs> well, I heard that you have a thirst for linters. I do, I do, and I heard that you don't use a linter. Yeah, the um, static analysis tools is just something that I find very enjoyable because, like, I've been a JavaScript developer before. And I was always kind of frustrated with all of the problems that popped up with the, the code. Um, so I worked with um, ESLint on trying to figure out like what rules can we enable to make sure that these problems don't um, don't end up in our production code base. And um, at some point, I started work looking at Elm, which is basically a very good, fresh um, new perspective where all the problems that I had with ESLint or with JavaScript didn't appear anymore. Uh, but I still figured, like, yeah, it would still make sense to have a linter for Elm, even though like almost none of the, problem, the same problems apply. Does Elm offer uh, any powerful uh, refactoring tools? Uh, you mean, for instance, in IDs or? Yes, uh, for instance, uh, Java developers enjoy very high-level abstraction uh, refactoring tools, such as uh, they can highlight a block of code and say, mm. extract into method. Yeah. Or they can even take a, a function and just reorder the parameters, and it will update every call site at once. Yeah. Um, do you have anything like this for Elm? Uh, we have to some extent, but definitely not to the same level. Um, but it's just a matter of someone needs to uh, be passionate about it and tackle those issues. because. We have so much more knowledge about uh, what the, the code is doing in Elm compared to Java or other languages, of, in my opinion, that it's all doable. Uh, so it's just a matter of someone needs to do it. Uh, we have some uh, refactorings, like we can extract variables, we can rename things, but that's about it for now. Well, and more of it. Oh, that's yeah. pretty nice. What, what do you have for Zig? Do you? Uh, have a good integration with, I think VS, VS Code is the one where that supports six the best? Yeah, the best we have for now is a third-party uh, language server protocol mm -hmm. implementation. Yep. Um, but it's, uh, it's kind of a best effort implementation and you know, third-party. It doesn't come with the compiler. It can, it can break separately. Um, is, is it best effort because you're not the focus on has been there yet, or yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't work on it. Uh, yeah. You know, someone from the community works on it, and they, they do a great job. But um, uh, shout outs to uh, uh, August uh, for working on that. Um, but it, there's only so much you can do without it being integrated with the actual type information that the compiler has. Um, but I will say that the investment in the future that we've done for this for the future is uh, designing the language without. Um, with, with conditional compilation being um, a first class part of the language rather than being through you know textual uh, preprocessor what do you, what do you mean what does that change so you know if if I have uh, an IDE for C or C++ code and part of my a my C library API is that one of the functions is just a macro that gets replaced that gets textually replaced mm, okay. then you know refactoring tools they don't know how to deal with this because it's not one language; it's two languages, and one of them is uh, yeah. text, you know, text-based concatenation, and it doesn't know how to. Yeah, if your language could, if it was somewhat standard that you had macros that were being replaced on all over the place, well, then the tool could analyze it. Well, okay, well, we know that there's ma this macro in the code base, therefore it will be replaced at this location, this location, this location. Um, but if if those macros get too custom, then it's really hard to analyze, right? And therefore, you lose all the guarantees about, oh, well, I can't see any go-to uh, um, 
um, instruction here. Therefore, I know that it's not doing anything weird. But if you have macros that change the code, then you lose that kind of guarantee. Right? Yeah, you lose that kind of guarantee, or you have to execute the preprocessor and then assume that you know one set of defines is true. Mm. And but maybe you know if you your build system changes the option, then this other if def defines it the other way, and so then you try to do a refactoring tool, but then it's wrong yep. for all the places where the other definition would be activated. Yeah, you you can't you know <laughs> you yeah, can't solve all, the problem. And also, you have to point the the, the error at some point, right? At, at some location in the code base. But if that code base doesn't exist because that's the result of applying the macro, then what are you pointing at? Well, so yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Do you want to talk about uh, errors versus warnings? Oh, sure. So during my talk, I talked about uh, severity levels. So some um, linters they allow you to specify. Uh, for each rule, how you want them to in influence the um, exit code of the, of, the, of the linter. If you have a rule that is said to be a, an error, then whatever it reports will cause the linter to exit with an error code, meaning that it will fail, uh, cause your test to fail, and you will be notified and you ha will have to fix it. And then you also have warnings, which um, do not cause your linter to exit with an error code. And uh, as I said during the talk, that doesn't really make much sense because you're trying to enforce a rule without trying to enforce it. Because you, you enable a rule and you say, well, if I, I want this rule to be enforced, but I also don't want it to cause the, lint the test to fail, so therefore it's not enforced. <laughs> and that doesn't that just doesn't make sense. I completely agree. Like, yeah. Uh, okay, but let's try to uh, explore this idea. So, mm. um, we yeah. talked. You talked about uh, false positives, mm -hmm. and you gave your example of your favorite uh, linter rule, uh, which I also happen to uh, have as a favorite, which is uh, dead code, unused variables, unused functions. Get yeah. get rid of them. Yeah, love that. Um, that one is not one that has false positives. But what about a linter rule that is useful, mm -hmm. but you, it fundamentally must have false positives in it? Can, uh, can you think of any? Or perhaps do you think that there should never be this kind of linter rule? Uh, yeah, so code smells are mm, usually yeah, code those, smells. those kinds, right? Um, we, also say, we always say it's code smell because it's probably a sign that there's something bad about it. But we don't know for sure. Sometimes it's good, just like cheese. <laughs> it smells bad, but in some cases, it's good. Um, so yeah, co code smells, um, whatever that might be for your language or your ecosystem. If it smells like a stinky foot, could be a bug, could be blue cheese. Or a stinky foot. Or and a stinky it, foot. It, it, and a stinky foot is better than no foot. <laughs> Oh, I see. I see your point. Your point is that um, maybe it is smelly code, uh, but there's no other way around it. Uh, this problem is hairy, and this only the sneaky foot has hair on it. Potentially. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This analogy has gone quite far. <laughs> uh, but do you have an example <laughs> of a uh, of, of a smell code smell lint? Mm. I'm going somewhere with this. I mean, I'm going to ask okay. about. Um, uh, disable comments, but I want to come up with an mm -hmm. example first that we can examine. Yeah, the thing is, I don't have too many examples because when we have too many counterexamples in when we're trying to think of a rule, we tend to not implement that rule. Mm, right, right, right. So, yeah, it's a bit tricky for me because I I've just what, what if didn't think about those in, in for, for, a while. for Elm, right? Yeah. But what, Elm. If, what if you're stuck with a more legacy language? You know, C, C, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's, we don't, the language is not as nice, and so we might have more smells. Yeah. So, yeah, in, in those cases, for instance, you could say, well, you should never access anything on null, right? Mm, okay. Um, and imagine if we imagine we're targeting JavaScript and not TypeScript, we don't have any information about um, whether something is notable or not. Well, then you pretty much have to tar to report everything, right? If you don't say, oh, if this parameter 
is not null, then uh, you can do this. If it's null, then you do something else. But if you don't have those checks, then you're going to have to report any, every usage of it. So do you see what I mean? Uh, so what is the lint? The lint is... So yeah, uh, let's imagine the lint is uh, we want to report any uh, field usage of a potentially null value. Like if you do a dot b, then if we if we haven't checked that a is mm. null or not null. Well, what if what if a comes from the function parameter and it's ex we're mm -hmm. expecting it to never be null on? How how would you tell it that it shouldn't be null if you don't have types? Oh, I see. So you would need to assert that it's not null, and that yeah. assertion would make the linter error go away. Yeah. Okay. This sounds okay. It sounds kind of nice, actually. Yeah, but you would have a lot of false positives because you know, oh, right. well, this function is never called with a null value. We know it because we right. have asserted before. Mm -hmm. But because the linter doesn't know that, it has to force you to reassert that it's not null. Mm -hmm. Well, that answers my question because the next question I was going to ask is uh, why not? I mean, you mentioned that you think that there's never a, a reason to have a disable comment uh, for a linter. I wouldn't say never. Oh, not never. Okay. But it should be very rare. Very rare. And it, well, you you already showed that in this case, uh, it could be disabled not with a comment, but with an assert. Yeah. And that's better. That, yeah. And that doesn't count as a disabled comment, right? No, th that is you pushing towards uh, better code or code that reads more like you, what you want, right? That's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to admit, during your talk, I was thinking to myself, there has to be lints where you need to disable them, but now that we're trying to think of any, I'm yeah. coming up dry. Yeah, in some cases it will be like, we don't have the information that we need, uh, but people can always change their codes in a way that the linter can understand that, hey, here there's no problem because we added, we added an assert or we added an if condition where it's, we say, is this value null? Things like that. So. Whenever you get a, a linter report, you always have to change your code, be it through a disable comment or through changing the code. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Do you want to talk about uh, auto fix or uh, prompts, fix, fix prompts? Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, so, what I talked during my presentation was that um, linters they tend to have this feature where they automatically fix some of the issues which is a very hard thing to do. Like, uh, I don't know if you've written any linter rules uh, um, in your career, uh, but writing a linter rule that does the right thing always is very hard. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of gathering contact, gathering information, and do some logic to figure out is there a problem or is there no problem. Um, and writing a fix for it is a lot harder because you need to gather a lot more information to make sure that you don't change the code to something that will not compile, that will break. Mm -hmm. Maybe even that um, doesn't look weird code style-wise. Like the indentation still needs to be right, all right. right. And you might not have type information. We might not have type information. Um, so yeah. So fixes are super useful, but they, c they can be done in a trustworthy or untrustworthy way. So. The example that I took was for ESLint, where I said um, if you run ESLint dash dash fix, it will fix all of the issues that it that it can fix automatically. Um, and the problem is that if you do that on a new project or you just enabled a very large uh, a new rule that changes a lot of things, then you have a very big diff, mm -hmm. and that diff can be very hard to to analyze. And the problem is that um, the linter doesn't tell you which errors were reported, and it doesn't tell you um, how it tried to fix each individual uh, issue. And therefore, you have a lot of trouble figuring out whether the change was safe um, and whether you can push this to production. So what I do with Elm Review is when you run it with the fix um, flag, uh, it prompts you for every error um, with a fix. like. It tells you all the details, like this is why I'm reporting this issue, uh, this is what you did wrong, uh, but I think I can fix this. Would you like th to accept this change? Uh, yes or no? And by doing this process of 
prompting for every um, uh, error, uh, we can get to just the tool. Um, because we see that it's doing the, the correct thing. We see, well, it suggested this, it, it reported this problem, it suggested this fix. That looks pretty good to me. Um, and if I see that it does that a hundred times in a row, I start to trust it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and only when you trust the tool, then we have an Elm review fix all um, uh, feature to fix all the issues in one go and then prompt you. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, I have to admit, though, I, I found myself thinking while watching um, your talk on this mm -hmm. that uh, you know you showed a 600 line diff, and the alternative is you know uh, a command line prompt that shows you a small diff. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know, 100 times that adds up to 600 line diff. Yeah. And uh, for me personally, I actually would rather pick the 600 line diff because. On one hand, it's nice that the smaller prompt will give you the context, mm -hmm. but it's going to be the same issue over and over again, right? You know, it did the same fix, the same fix, the same fix. If it's the same rule, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. If, if there are like, if you have two hundred rules that each do a different thing and fix the issue or fix their issue in different ways, then those compounds. You have yeah, yeah. One transformation, then another transformation, then another transformation, and the code, the beginning code and the end result code. They look very different. Right, right. So you don't know like how many errors were reported, how many fixes were applied. Because it might be multiple fixes in the same lines. Yes. I understand, yeah. Yeah, and so in I, that yeah. case, it's, it gets complex. Yeah. If you only have a single rule that reports all these issues, yeah, go use fix all. If you think that looking at a gen diff is good enough in, in this case, Go for it. That's when that's see, why you have yeah. Elm review fix all. So if so if the so maybe just uh, you know if scrolling through the diff is is fastest and the changes are simple enough, then perfect. Yes. But it's nice to have that advanced option for when it's a little more tricky to understand what just happened. Yeah. At least we have this tool that can break it down. So you're never just trying to trust. You don't have to trust the tool. You can you can have it, the tool explain to you why, why is it doing what it's doing. You, you don't have to trust the tool. Right. I see. Right. I see your point. Yeah. You don't yeah. trust it. You you submit to it. Is what I like to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But because imagine you're a junior developer, you just started uh, using JavaScript, uh, you just start using ESLint because someone told you it was good, and you you run <laughs> ESLint fix, and then it changes the code in in very different ways and you have no clue like I don't I barely knew what the code was doing before now I don't know what it's it's doing now well yeah if like, I'm a, if I'm a junior developer I'm going to assume that the tool knows better than me and accept it blindly right yeah I mean I I would just read the diff but if I was a junior developer that I would I would just assume that someone else knows better than me and just say yes 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 <laughs> but that, that's not always correct right because right because right. the the fix is just a suggestion of a fix right right yeah the for instance if you have an unused variable the fix is to remove it right but potentially it's the code that I just wrote and the correct solution to that is to start using it somewhere. Right, right. So that's also a reason why I like to push towards uh, prompting for every fix, um, is to notice, oh, there's something that I did wrong and that the tool won't help me with. Yeah. So the tool is not doing something wrong, but it, uh, there are sometimes better solutions to the problem. Okay, so here's a question. Mm -hmm. So you're uh, you've written Elm review, and you have some you've you've put a lot of thought into the um, well, the workflow of using linters. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I've created the Zig compiler, and the Zig compiler is it has a, has more features than a lot most compilers. It's not a bare bones compiler. I mean, it has formatter built into it. Um, it okay. has uh, I mean, it has unused variable errors. And in a branch, I haven't merged it yet, but I, I have this dash dash fix uh, mm -hmm. feature in the compiler directly, not a separate linting tool. Yeah. Um, so the topic I wanted to bring up for you is, can we talk about the trade-offs of having uh, linting errors, so stuff like you know removing unused variables, um, maybe other things like that too. I'm sure that the C compiler has a lot of warnings that you don't have. Yeah, uh, we, we do not have warnings. Okay. Uh, only errors. Okay. Uh, so sounds good to me. Sounds good, right? <laughs> okay, but but we also don't have a linter. 
Yep. Uh, and yes. and so people do find it annoying that when they're trying to iterate quickly, they are not allowed to have unused variables. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, one obvious choice is just separate the linter uh, step from the compilation step. And that's that's yes. the workflow that you've described. Yes, uh, uh, I think that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so then so then here's here's the downside though. Uh, if I'm looking at someone's code, then uh, maybe they didn't run the linter step. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at it and I'm and I'm seeing this function and I'm trying to understand it and it's it's annoying because it doesn't make sense. Why why is it doing this? Why is it doing this? And then 30 minutes later I realize it's never called. And that <laughs> explains it, right? Yeah. So it would have been nice if that linter guarantee was there. But they just didn't run the linter yet because it's not Tuesday. I don't know. Yeah. You see so, what I'm saying? So, so in which context are you looking at it? Because that that changes the how you think about it as well. For instance, if you have a pull request mm -hmm. and the tests are green, and you look at the code, then you will still have the guarantee. Well, all the code that is there is used mm, because I see. the linter has run. If you're looking at code that um, is still being written, like you're pairing with someone or someone says, hey, I have a bug, can you help me uh, mm. fix it? Then, sure, uh, the code might be unused, mm. but for a good reason, because they're still working on the function um, and they may want to clean it up later. So it really depends on the context of where you're, when you're looking at the, uh, the code, I think. Uh, you could also say, well, if I want to look at any zig code um, on the internet, uh, just like in a GitHub GIST or something, just mm -hmm. um, then I want to know whether um, all the used things are used or not. But someone might base some uh, non compiling Zinc code as well. That's true. So, yeah. I, th I think if you don't have a CI running next to the code that you're looking at, or you just run the test, then you don't have any guarantees. Anyway, mm. I think that's an interesting point. So, yeah, one kind of takeaway, at least for me, from this conversation is that uh, linting is fundamentally related to the idea of continuous integration. Yes, like if you have a linter, but you don't enforce it at, uh, in your CI or in your test suite, mm -hmm. that's no use. Right, it's right. just like having warnings for everything. Right, so we have this this phase of the development cycle. There's the the development phase, and then there's the <coughs> integration phase. And even if you have continuous integration, that's still a separate phase. It happens mm -hmm. when you make the patch set to send. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. What about? Okay, so I'm just brainstorming here. Mm -hmm. Are there any projects that justifiably do not have a separate integration phase? So when you say integra integration phase, you mean specifically what? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm calling uh, the part where you run the CI tests. Mm -hmm. you may, maybe you make a pull request, and then the tests run automatically you yeah. know, before you merge it. That's the integration phase, okay. right? The development phase would be on the local developer's computer before they submit the patch. So is there, are there any projects where an integration phase doesn't make sense? Well, where, where, where the, the team justifiably does not have an integration phase. So I, I, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to make a point. I'm actually just musing out yeah. loud. Like maybe, I don't know, maybe video game companies don't have an integration phase. Or maybe their integration phase is you play test the code. I don't know. Yeah. I think there might be two use cases uh, that I can think of. Uh, one is when the product or the project is very early um, in its development phase. Mm -hmm. And people don't care about the code quality. Um, like we've seen a, a, a talk from Henrik um, about the fact that code quality should be done after the prototyping mm. because you want to iterate, you want to explore ideas, and afterwards, then you can think about code quality. Mm -hmm. um, but then you could just not do the linter step on that case as well. Potentially, right? yeah. Um, it's an approach that I haven't tried out, so I'm curious to to know how it would work out. Maybe you would only enable some of the linter rules and when for the code that you know has been um, sh should be in the code quality phase, then you enable more rules for the, that specific part of the code base. Maybe. 
Well, that, that was uh, yeah. pretty interesting. Do you, uh, do you have any other topics that you uh, want to examine? Yeah. Um, so, from the little I've seen from Zig, um, it cares a lot about guarantees. Like you, you told me, like I see some Zig code. I want to know. I want to have the guarantee that um, this function here is used, that this function compiles, that it will not crash, um, stuff like that. It's things that are enforced by a compiler, potentially by a linter or a code formatter. And I feel like the, the same happens with Elm. Like we care a lot about the guarantees, about adding constraints that give us a lot of things in return. And I feel like that's something that is quite recent. Um, ish. Uh, so I've worked with JavaScript before where you had almost no guarantees. <laughs> You've worked with C where you have th a lot of things can go wrong. And I feel like the language that um, pop out recently, um, especially the ones that come with the functional par uh, programming paradigm, they care a lot about giving guarantees about the code, about how it will um, execute. And I feel like is there a trend to add more guarantees in languages? Is that something that we now all care about? What do you think? Mm, I actually do not think that that's the case. Oh. Because okay. I do see a lot of uh, contemporary new languages, which they don't seem to focus on it too much. Mm -hmm. Do you have any examples? Oh, well, you're, uh, you're going to make me burn, <laughs> burn in other projects, huh? <laughs> um, I, I will give an example. So. Uh, the example I will give will be NIM. So NIM's emphasis is on uh, flexibility and power. And so you can do some really impressive things with the uh, with uh, uh, NIM macros. Like I think I think that they they pride themselves on having uh, a lot of the core syntax, such as just like plus and minus and division and things like this, uh, defined in the standard library. Mm -hmm. um, you can also implement uh, async await with in, in user land in NIM, which mm -hmm. is pretty cool, right? It's pretty powerful that you can do that. That's a fundamental transformation of the control flow of a function that to make it async await. Yeah, and they they do that with um, like the powerful metaprogramming tools that the language exposes. You see where I'm going with this, though. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're reading a function. Does it use a powerful metaprogramming technique to fundamentally change what that function does? Maybe. You don't have that guarantee. It doesn't say it explicitly. It does it implicitly. Ooh, I don't know enough. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know enough. But I mean, you could just be scrolled down and you're not looking at the top of the function or something like this. Do you sure. see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, whereas uh, with, with Zig, it's a trade off. So we don't, we don't have some of these powers. Like you can't implement async await in user land, I, it's part mm -hmm. of the language syntax. Yep. Um, but if you're in the middle of a function just looking at you know, a piece of code, you have a lot of guarantees that if you see you know, this variable and you see the definition of that variable somewhere else on outer scope, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, not a, it's not shadowed or uh, redefined or something like this. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, there's, there's my uh, my crafty. I'm not I'm not trying to burn them, <laughs> but there's an example for you. Language. Yeah. yeah. So, so what do you care about having so many guarantees? This preference. I mean, it's just a, my subjective opinion is that I I like to make reading code uh, the the easiest thing to do with the language. And uh, we we see this sometimes. Um, uh, sometimes people use um, advent of code to mm -hmm. learn Zig, and it doesn't really go well for them. Because advent of code is write-only code. You're never going to come back and read it again. <laughs> yes. You don't care about it. It's, it's a small you know, 20, 30 line program. And it's just it's write-only. But I mean, Zig code is almost read-only. You know, it's meant, it's, obviously it's not read-only because you have to edit it. But you know, Zig code is meant to be maintained. It's meant to be refactored, moved around. It's meant to be a large code base that you're trying to manage the complexity of. Yeah, and uh, and secure and safe. And yeah, all, all that good stuff. Refactor it, and it will still work. Yeah, and and this I have to tell you. So I have um, uh, a, a lot of our you know, linter errors. I guess you can call them like unused variables. Mm -hmm. uh, there's categories of errors. So some require the type checker, but some can operate directly on a file. They don't need. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't matter what flags you pass. It doesn't matter what target 
you pass. Like mm -hmm. we know if you have an unused variable just based on the file alone, mm -hmm. nothing yep. else. Um, so I have this on on save. So when I save a file in Zig, it runs the formatter and it will give me uh, like an error list for unused variables, uh, for use of undeclared variables, like a certain class of errors that are detected on like just a file level. Those mm -hmm. are all reported just instantly. Yeah. And I love it so much for refactoring because all I have to do is just grab a block of code. I can just cut and paste code. I don't even read the code. I just cut it, I paste it, I put it somewhere else. Or if I want a piece of logic from this function, I just move it. Yeah. And then I get errors for, it, it's almost like I, I reached into a robot and just like grab their arm and then I just put it on another robot. And then I just get an error for every wire I just need to like <laughs> reattach to the, you know, that's exposed. And then it works. Yeah. Because of all these guarantees. Yeah. I, I love that, uh, just the ability to move large pieces of code around. Yeah. Do, do you also call it if it compiles, it works? Because we do that in Elm all the time. Yeah. I mean, that, it's subjective and I'm biased, but I, I definitely feel that way. Yeah. 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 I'm guessing there's also the bias like, well, I'm a senior engineer. <laughs> I have experience. So, of course, it's going to work because I did the right things. <laughs> but does it also work for a junior? Well, maybe. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's lessons to be learned in order to get to that level, but uh, the, uh, the, the power is there. You know? Yeah. I uh, absolutely understand the, the need and the longing for that kind of safety. Mm -hmm. We have it in Elm as well, and it's just amazing. Yeah. It, it's, it's so so. It's so hard to imagine coding without it, because, because I know that I'm gonna make a lot of mistakes, and I just want some tool to help me figure out that I miss that I messed up. Yeah. When I'm gonna mess up? Okay, here's an interesting topic. So I'm used to doing imperative programming, where mm -hmm. the goal is that uh, I write code, and at the end of the day, it's machine code, you know, and that's that's the transformation, mm -hmm. targeting a virtual machine or actual machine. You're used to doing functional programming in Elm, mm -hmm. and you're used to having a certain kinds of guarantees. We both understand the guarantees, but let's try to find uh, let's try to find a bonus guarantee that you have in Elm mm -hmm. that I don't have in Zig because of imperative versus functional. Yeah, but you I, have to help me because uh, you're the you have the expert on what yeah is available to you. I have referential transparency. Okay, can you explain that? Um, so, basically, when you do an operation, mm -hmm. if you take the same code and you put it somewhere else, they will give you the, the same results. So, doing the same operation will give you the same results. Mm. For the same inputs, you get the same outputs. Uh, that is only true if you don't have any side effects or side causes, mm -hmm. like accessing global variables, mutating them, um, uh, making HTTP calls, things like that. Um, because in Elm, uh, you don't have imputations, you don't have side effects, everything is just pure computation um, based on the inputs and based on constants. Uh, you're always going to get the same um, result for the same inputs. And that can give some, um, that can make some simplifications a lot easier. For instance, if you do uh, if um, f of zero, is equal to f of zero, then do something. Mm -hmm. Well, in a functional language, or at least a pure functional language, we don't care what f, what f is. We don't care about the implementation. We know that it's one function with the argument zero, and we compare it to the same function with the same arguments. So we know those are always going to be equal. Mm. So we can simplify that um, if expression to Oh, I see. At the it. call site, you can simplify this. Yeah, for instance. Ah, I so see. Those kinds of simplifications we, we can do. We can also move code around uh, without caring about, well, did this um, function depend on this other function to be called first? Mm. So we can move it very easily. Uh, a linter can do that for us. And um, you can do that with uh, imperative languages uh, by either getting false positives or by doing a lot of um, static analysis to figure out whether this is okay or not to do. But then it would only work if the programmer cooperated 
and wrote functions that did not have side effects, right? Yeah, um, yeah. If yeah, or, or you would have false positives. Mm. But you could also have the linter be very smart about it, do a lot of extensive research. Like, does this function have any side effect? Does it access global variables that the other function also does? Mm -hmm. um, and that is very, very tricky to do, mm -hmm. I, th I think. I haven't tried it, but um, I think in some cases you will reach some um, missing information. For instance, it's using a function from a dependency. If you don't know what the code in the dependency is doing, then you don't know. Does that, can you call that function twice in a row without having any mm, I see. weird effect? Yeah. We don't know. Therefore, we have some missing information. And when we have missing information, you either have false positives or false negatives. Yeah. I think that the bulk of imperative code, I'm trying to think when it, when it might apply to this scenario or not. I think the bulk of imperative code would have a, um, not a, necessarily a global variable, but all of these functions, mm -hmm. um, you know, let's say A, B, C, D, E, F, or whatever, uh, they'd be methods. So they would all yeah. take as the first parameter a mutable pointer to some shared state, which effectively acts as a global, a global variable. Mm -hmm. But it's not global, but, you know, it, the sequence of function calls is, these me these methods are basically operating on an object instance yep. and mutating it, and that's kind of the only mutations. So if we were able to in functional programming or in in imperative, okay, yeah, I think that if we were able to model these as uh, if these mutations were able to be to be modeled, then we could we could have these uh, these kind of abstractions of you know, I, I don't know what, what's the purposes for optimization or for linter warnings or something. Um, the use case I'm thinking of is uh, simplifying code. Like, oh yeah, you gave yeah. the example with uh, what map, right? Yeah, if, if you do um, list dot map on uh, on a list, and then you um, you take the result of that and you call list dot concat, which is like a flat map concat map, um, then you can just use list dot um, concat map instead in mm -hmm, Elm. Mm -hmm. And you have multiple of these um, similars and transformations that you can do. But if you care about the, if the order of operations matter, then this can be a um, potentially breaking change in the sense that it will break your code. Right, right. Like uh, I know that OCaml is a um, functional language, but it doesn't have uh, purity. So, for instance, whenever it tries to do um, list.map, it will always try to keep the order of the individual function calls the same. Mm. So, uh, we, we call list.map with an, a function f. Well, we call f of the first element, then f of the second one, uh, element, and so on and so on. And they have to keep that order, otherwise um, uh, the code might change. Right, because the, the code might change. is allowed to rely on uh, on that property. Yep. Yeah, understand. And if you have a pure functional language, then move it around just you, like you want. Uh, so, so this is called referential yeah. transpar transparency. Yeah, I, I think so. I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's it. Uh, given the same inputs, you get the same outputs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's uh, the essence of a pure functional language, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I, uh, I enjoyed exploring some of these ideas with you. I'm I'm definitely yeah. walking away from here. Uh, I don't know, rethinking some of my um, conclusions about uh, the role of of linting in the Zig compiler. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I really enjoyed this talk as well. And maybe you will make Zig a functional language soon. <laughs> 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 well, thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you too.